Welcome to episode 23 of the Yoga Meets Movement Science podcast. We are here today to take a look at the good question of, does yoga count as exercise? Can we consider a yoga practice to be a form of exercise? And this is a really good question. I feel like uh, people, especially kind of in the more like general public realm, who may not be super familiar with actually practicing yoga on the mat, they may just like wonder. Like I, um, in my experience with topics like this, I've seen the question arise of, is yoga like a quote, like difficult or challenging enough movement practice in order to even qualify as exercise? Like, does it count as exercise? So I know there are wonderings about that out there, like from that side of things, but also on the flip side of things, being someone who really is deep in the yoga world and has been for a long time, I'm also familiar with ideas within the yoga world where yoga is kind of this complete practice and that it actually could give you or your body like everything it could possibly need when we're thinking in terms of like a movement practice or an exercise practice. So that's kind of on the other side of, uh, of the spectrum. And so like, could yoga possibly give us everything we need in terms of say exercise and health, or is yoga like not even hard enough to be considered exercise at all? That's kind of like the, the two ends. And as usual with what Travis and I tend to talk about on the podcast, we're taking a more nuanced look at this. And there's probably somewhere in the middle that might be a little more supported by what the evidence might suggest. And I'd just like to point out that in this conversation, when we talk about yoga, we're referring to what might be called modern postural yoga or yoga as we see uh, practice in the West today. So that's what yoga like, can be a bigger category and it can look like different things aside from that. But for today, um, that's what we're referring to is those types of yoga practices. Um, and for and of course, these questions bring up other other really good questions that we have to dive into in order to really have a conversation about this like when you're asking does yoga count as exercise well what do you mean by exercise uh what do you mean by yoga like i just mentioned today we're thinking of yoga as modern postural yoga but even within that category there are so many different iterations of yoga and different versions of yoga it can look like many different things so what are we talking about and then uh, when it comes to exercise, there are many different components of exercise. And so, you know, can yoga help with with certain components uh, more and others less? Like it's just, it's a much more complex question than we might realize on the surface. So today our plan is to kind of take a deeper look at that and break down some of those questions. So Travis, I have a question for you being someone who obviously longtime yogi, but also uh, very in like the fitness and strength and conditioning world. Have you ever come across like people just want, like people maybe thinking of yoga as people just kind of sitting around and meditating and maybe just it to them, it's just like, well, of course yoga is not exercise. Like that's not moving your body in a challenging enough way to be exercise? Sure. Well, when you compare it to other types of activities that we like everyone would agree with our exercise, then mm -hmm. you really are led to wonder, well, could this movement form where we're confined to a mat, we're often mm -hmm. focusing maybe more on stretching, we're mm -hmm. not moving that quickly. We're really focused on our breath. There's a meditative component to it. Like that doesn't sound like going for a jog <laughs> or playing a sport that we so characteristically think of mm -hmm. as exercise. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think I've, yeah, I've heard like similar questions and points of view from people who just who maybe aren't really that familiar with how yoga like actually can be practiced and yeah so that that's the tricky part is like well we have to make sure that we are conceptualizing yoga in the correct way make, making sure that we're taking into account all of the ways that yoga could be considered exercise and and being aware of what what that yoga is more than stretching and breathing on a mat mm -hmm. first of all and then like <laughs> right. you said originally well what actually constitutes exercise that's right and so maybe maybe we could look at that a little bit like what what actually 
what is exercise? Like, is there a technical definition? Like, according to whom? Like, who decides these things? Who yeah, do? that's a well. That's a really. <laughs> that's maybe the first question is like, who gets to decide what exercise mm -hmm. even is? Because, mm -hmm. but again, we have to have that agreed upon definition of what exercise is, and then right. we can agree upon <laughs> our definition of yoga, and then we can <laughs> see how well those things align, right? Exactly. It's just, yeah, like there's so much more to the question of does yoga count as we have to ask a lot of further questions in order to really clarify and then attempt some sort of answer. Yeah. And like you said, whether something counts isn't such a black and white mm. question. Like, mm -hmm. is this exercise yes or no? Well, in some <laughs> respects, maybe it is. In some respects, maybe it isn't or doesn't meet the full, all of the parameters. And then does that just mean, well, if it doesn't meet all of the parameters, is it not exercise or is it, is it, you know, 50% exercise? Is it 50%? That's a, I had not thought of it. Like it's, yeah, it's easy to just be it's like, just, is it checkbox yeah, it, or no, it's, but. Right. But when, really when you bad. break the box down into many sub boxes, mm -hmm. then you say, well, how many boxes does it have to check? And I think we're going to talk about that. <laughs> we are as well. Well, as an exercise science professor, which is what you are, um, you you teach about this to your exercise science students. Like um... I do. I do. Actually, it's kind of crazy because I have two, I, I teach a course called Introduction to Kinesiology, mm -hmm. and then I teach a course called Introduction to Exercise Science. And one mm. of the courses, this isn't super important, one of the courses is for my exercise science minors and one of the courses for exercise science majors. And the, although the terms kinesiology and exercise science are often used interchangeably, yeah. there is, even with those terms, there's actually a, a, a differentiating factor, which is that exercise science is a subdomain of kinesiology. So kinesiology, kinesiology is the study of physical activity, whereas exercise okay. science is the study of exercise oh. science. And that Whoa. it dovetails into what we'll be talking about, actually, which is that exercise is a subdomain of physical activity. And so even, even physical activity, actually, mm -hmm. people argue about the definition of that, uh, which I think is worth pointing out. So yeah. In in the kinesiology course that I teach, the the definition of kinesiology or the definition of physical activity that we use mm -hmm. is that it is all purposeful or intentional or voluntary movement done with a, a specific intention or goal in mind. So it doesn't it doesn't count like involuntary mm -hmm. reflexes, but mm -hmm. just about anything else does fit the bill. Now, where some other people will define physical activity. They'll say, well, it has, it's that, but it has to elevate your energy expenditure above baseline. Right. But what right. happens when you, when you make the definition narrower in that way is it excludes a lot of our activities of daily living and our fine motor activities that actually would be very relevant to people working in the kinesiology, this broad kinesiology mm. field. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, occupational therapists who work with people on fine motor tasks uh, like dressing or eating or right. um, uh, bathrooming. So yeah. those those skills aren't necessarily raising your energy expenditure above baseline, but they are things that we want to be able to study within this broader mm -hmm. umbrella of, of kinesiology. kinesiology and physical activity, which is the study of physical activity. So... Wow. Uh, anyway, that, that, that differentiation between, well, how do we first define physical activity? Mm -hmm. uh, and then exercise is this further subdomain that only really focuses on, um, well, I guess we're going to, I guess we're going to talk about that now. Yeah. So, <laughs> so exercise right. is this subset of physical activity mm -hmm. and even within this, there are various definitions, right. usually set forth by some sort of official governing body, which could be the American College of Sports Medicine or ACSM, mm -hmm. the National Strength and Conditioning Association. They have a definition. Uh, actually, actually, I looked in their textbook yesterday. They don't have a definition, but they do. They don't. They're, they're, 
thing, of course, is strength and conditioning. So it, it is exercise. They don't have a definition, but uh, the, the American ACS Heart does, Association, right? the mm -hmm. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, all of these mm -hmm. people set forth definitions, which are relatively overlapping. Mm -hmm. And basically the premise is that for something to be exercise, it has to be physical activity done to develop or maintain sound working body and reduce the risk of disease for the purpose of health longevity. So that's one definition. That's actually mm -hmm. the definition that came with in my kinesiology textbook. Mm -hmm. um, there's another definition, which is somewhat similar, a type of physical activity performed with the intention of improving physical fitness and or sport performance that right. happened to come from the psychology of exercise and fitness book, um, which is another course that I teach. Uh, there's uh, the th an, a third definition that comes from the ACSM. It's a structured movement practice that individuals consciously and voluntarily engage in and includes those activities that improve or maintain fitness and health. And then a fourth right. definition also from ACSM, all along the same lines, it's a type of physical activity consisting of planned, structured, and repetitive bodily movement done to improve and or maintain one or more components of physical fitness. So that one I, I think is actually a little bit different because they're introducing this idea that it has to be a repetitive body movement. And yeah. I don't know if I, I totally agree with that, but the, the common themes here we're seeing is it's consciously and voluntarily engaged in, the, and the intention is to improve physical fitness or health mm -hmm. or longevity or reduce the risk or, of disease. So those totally. are, that's exercise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, like, even with it, we just, I gave four definitions and mm -hmm. none of them are the same, but I think that's we right. can subtle differences. Yeah. We can surmise what the commonalities are. Absolutely. I think those bullet points you just listed, they make a lot of sense. They really resonate for me as at least in terms of just what I associate with exercise. Like yeah. So again, that's, that's this subdomain of physical activity. Mm -hmm. Like if you think of a, if you think of a, a diagram where you have physical activity as a big circle yeah. and then exercises inside it and sport is also yeah. inside it and sport and exercise can overlap to a degree. Um, and and all uh, both exercise and sport fit into physical activity but then right. physical activity includes even more things than that that makes sense because sport seems in my mind like it's a narrower category than exercise like you can exercise without it being a sport like you take a run right and you're not necessarily like on a team playing yeah competitively so the, the with definition the definition of sport is structured physical activity involving competition performed according to rules and customs. So it Got adds it. that those three added layers of there has to be competition and there has to be rules and customs, which and, um, exercise oh, doesn't necessarily, or that's right. Exercise can, when, when there, when there's an overlap between exercise and sport, then it can right. incorporate those, but it exercise doesn't, it doesn't have to have incorporate to. those things. And I think that we and probably all of our listeners who know and love yoga, I think we all kind of know that one of one of the core facets of a yoga practice is that it's specifically not competitive. Like you're not doing you're not in competition with like any other person in the room or it's just that's not a factor when it comes to yoga. So I think it'd be pretty safe to say that if competition is like part of what defines sport, that yoga is not a sport, uh, you know. At least like maybe it wouldn't belong within that category within exercise. It's yeah. Not, it's, we're not competing. It's not gonna people. not gonna show up in the Olympics in twenty twenty six or right. Exactly. In India, uh there are yoga competitions though, just saying. There are. But not here in the I West. And we're talking about didn't modern know posture. That. Yeah, there are. Yes, it can be treated competitively. Um, but we don't need to talk about that right now because we're talking about modern postural yoga as we see it practiced in the West, in which All it right. is not competitive and it's not a sport. But I have a I have a question for you mm -hmm. uh, related to what we've been talking about. So you, you I feel like you were talking about this overarching category of physical activity. And then we've got um, exercise, which is like a subcategory within that. So I'm just wondering, um, I know we've talked about this before at least once here on the podcast, but there's also this way of category, categorizing movements into, and some of our listeners may be familiar with the categories of eat versus neat. 
um, there's like two different ways that we can label movement. Like eat, it, it technically is exercise activity thermogenesis, and then neat is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And mm -hmm. as I'm asking the question, I'm realizing when I'm asking it that that these two terms kind of come up when um, when movement is talked about more in terms of energy expenditure, like specifically in a uh, number of calories that you're burning through your movements. Uh, so maybe it's maybe it's a little bit different than just general movement versus exercise. But I'm just wondering if you see a relationship there between um, eat and neat. So eat being like exercise activity and neat being non-exercise activity, but still movement. Do you think there's some overlap there with this idea of like physical activity? And then yeah, I, th I think neat neatly fits into the box of mm -hmm. physical activity that's non-exercise. So if exercise is all those things that we mentioned mm -hmm. and you're still moving intentionally and, and maybe or maybe not elevating your mm -hmm. expenditure above baseline. But so we're talking about things like walking or cleaning the house mm -hmm. or even like um, parking farther away from the entrance, yeah. um, taking, work, the stairs, taking the stairs, even fidgeting. Yes, fidgeting, it technically is, yeah. Yeah, or maybe standing I think, versus I think like, sitting. I know it's right. but either one is not super active, but but these are but always where active. you can, yeah, <laughs> where you can increase your thermogenesis. Which is your or, generation of heat, mm -hmm. like the body generating heat thermogenesis. Yeah, above just sedentary resting. Right. And that's kind of my understanding is that like neat uh, versus versus eat those categories for movements. It's it's kind of all of that contrasted to just sedentary, which is when like mm -hmm. you're sitting in a chair or, or lying down or, you know, because we, as we know, in modern Western society, we do have like lifestyles that tend to be very sedentary. And so this awareness on uh, just, or this idea of raising awareness about the fact that yes, exercise, like structured exercise is very important for health. But if you exercise for an hour out of your day and you sleep for say eight hours a day, you still have all these other hours in which, yeah. um, so you know. I actually, I, I was just revisiting this concept recently. Um, there's, there's of course, whether you exercise and whether you don't, right? Mm -hmm. and And, that could be a measure of how active a person is. But then there's also the question of whether you are sedentary or whether you just happen to move, like you have a job where you move around. Mm -hmm. Let's say right. you're an elementary school teacher and you're on your feet, walking around your classroom uh, yeah. 20,000 steps a day. So it, it's basically like this two by two matrix as opposed to just do you exercise or do you not? But it's do you exercise or do you not? And then are you sedentary or are you yeah, a mover? Those are separate so, categories, yeah. right? So you could so I personally exercise, yeah. but I also have a relatively sedentary job. Mm -hmm. in most of my days of sitting at a computer and preparing lectures and answering emails. That's right. Um, and so you're so like a sedentary exercise. I am a sedentary exerciser, but I, I could also be a an active exerciser like somebody who moves around a lot from my day to day and mm -hmm. in addition to that exercise or i could be a an active non-exerciser i move around That's a lot right. but i don't particularly exercise or i could be neither so i'm sedentary and i don't exercise i'm oh a sedentary non so it's this it's interesting to think about like okay it's not just do you exercise or do you, like from a broad standpoint of quant uh, or qualifying or quantitatively, not quantitative, qualitatively describing your, 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 whatever, your, your activity yeah. uh -huh. plus your exercise, thinking of these two categories as opposed to just, well, do you exercise or do you not? And I think that that's a really good to point out and really important because, yeah, I think the maybe the major, the general public understanding of the messaging has been for a long time, like exercise is what's important. And it certainly is. But there's this whole other category to all the other um, hours. Yeah, of the day. it's That's it's great that I also. exercise three days a week, but then I sit mm -hmm. for eight hours, twelve hours a day on top of that. So, sure, maybe I'm counteracting some of that, but wouldn't it be much better if I also moved around during the day in addition to the three hours Precisely. that I exercise per week? 
So as we can see, the topic of exercise, movement, uh, and all these different ways it can be categorized, it can really be like it's complex and you can go into a lot of layers um, when it comes to when it comes to these questions. Uh, but if we're looking today at like the practice of yoga and whether or not it counts as exercise, like I think obviously yoga, yoga would count as as general movement or physical activity, but mm -hmm. can it be considered exercise? And uh, to the extent that exercise is an activity that may help contribute to someone's overall fitness and improve their levels of fitness and associated health, uh, maybe we could take a look at like what what fitness actually is, because maybe we all have kind of a general sense of like what it means to be fit, but on a technical and really kind of like an exercise uh, in this exercise science realm, there are many sub components to what really comprise fitness, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, this question ties back to, well, who defines fitness and mm -hmm. all of those same governing bodies, the ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, the National Strength and Conditioning Association, NSCA, each of these bodies lays out their criteria for what defines mm -hmm. fitness. Uh, sometimes there's five categories, sometimes there's mm -hmm. 10. If you look across all of them, you could probably find a baker's dozen. And right. so I right. think we it's can- a really good point. Maybe we can lay those out and then yeah. one by one, you know, describe what each of them are and then talk about whether fitness or not whether fitness, whether <laughs> yoga constitutes that element of fitness. Yeah, I think I think that that's that's a really good idea to help just kind of increase our, our appreciation of like what comprises fitness. Yeah. And I know earlier we talked about how sometimes there can be this general impression that a yoga practice isn't necessarily difficult enough to even be exercised. Like sometimes people wonder about that, like, could it be exercise? But I also mentioned that on the flip side, when, when I've been really deep uh, immersed in the yoga world, I have also gotten this strong, heard the strong message that a yoga practice is kind of just this like magical um, practice that, that can check all the boxes that your body could possibly need for physical health in terms of like categories like this. So, so from the outside, looking in people who don't know that much about it are like, that's not exercise. And then from the people who are really invested in it, they're like, this is magic, perfect exercise. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Yes. And I would suppose, uh, I would suspect that many of our, our listeners like to the yoga meets movement science podcast are probably like they're, um, I would, uh, mostly yogis, I would imagine, but probably not yogis who are necessarily aligned with that idea that yoga is a complete practice. And that just all, I think that, our general audience is kind of hip to the knowledge that yoga doesn't necessarily do all of that, but it certainly is. That messaging is definitely prevalent in the yoga world. You know, yoga world is a huge place and there can be, you know, different like sub sub communities within yoga, but I can speak from my own experience. I've talked about it on the podcast before, but how I practiced Ashtanga, which is one style of yoga, my source style Ashtanga for years and years back toward, that was like my earlier phase of my yoga practice. And I, distinctly remember, so this is just my experience, but I know, I know other people can relate to this, that, uh, that the Ashtanga community that I was in and our Ashtanga teachers, they very, um, they were very clear about the fact that our Ashtanga practice was, was giving our body all that we need. And we were, we were discouraged from, uh, uh partaking in other like physical there you activities. Go. As long so as you're just... practicing Ashtanga, then you're good. <laughs> Right. And that was just kind of the idea. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, it was not like our Ashtanga teachers were in charge of our lives or anything like they were, they were not like prescribing well, what we did. Off if you mouth. listen to that episode. <laughs> Where I talked about Ashtanga and how it's technically, it can be considered a cult. Yes. 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 And so it just, I just remember that it was just like Ashtanga or yoga was this elevated superior practice. We, we as yogis, like it was giving us everything we need and things like uh, taking a run or, or definitely lifting weights, definitely lifting weights, things like this. They were, we kind of looked down on that. You happen they to were do looked down on. both of <laughs> today. You're yeah. so, I absolutely do. I absolutely do. But back then you're, I was, you're bad. I know maybe that means, yeah, I guess I'm a bad yogi for doing other physical activities, 
But all of that is just to really, just to say that there is, there is a tendency in the yoga world to kind of elevate yoga as this magical practice that, that, you know, that, that is better and um, checks all the boxes we could possibly need. Maybe they're not hip to all the boxes that we're about to talk about. Precisely. Exactly. Uh, no, I, I think they're probably hip to most of the boxes, and but they tend to exaggerate some of yoga's benefits relative to some of the boxes. I think you're right. Cause like, yeah, I mean, we all are familiar with like some of these super general, general ways that exercise can be um, described or categorized. So we kind of have like a list of components of fitness to go through here. And like you said, um, some lists out there are short, some are longer. We just kind of picked ones that we, that made, that made sense to us for this conversation. It's and most our, of them. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. And our first item on the list, I will admit, it's one that I don't personally know very much about. I know you know more about me uh, about it than I do, but it's uh, body composition. And like uh, the ACSM, as we mentioned before, this really respected body when it comes to exercise, they have like five components of physical fitness and body composition is number one. It's like the first on, on the list. Um, so what is body composition, Travis? Body composition is like your the percent of your body that is made up of lean body mass and then the percent of your body that's made up of fat so uh percent body fat usually uh let's just i'm just gonna throw a somewhat ballpark number out maybe to be healthy for men mm. you might want it under 20 percent, and for women maybe you want it under 30 percent mm -hmm. uh I just, I'm not making those numbers up totally, but yeah, those are not, right. those are not, like an uh, estimate. yeah, those are not scientifically based by, or not, they're not, they're not recommendations that are coming from any of these governing bodies, but just to give people a, a, an idea, most, let's say professional male athletes, you could take 10% off and say they're probably around like 10 or 12% body fat. Mm -hmm. And then maybe professional female athletes, like 20% body fat. And then if you look at a professional bodybuilder, like somebody who's mm -hmm. competing on stage, all oiled up. Um, their phys it's about their physique, like how they look. Yeah, they they could be in the four to six. Whoa, they can be four fat. to six. Oh my gosh. Yeah, which is basically really nothing. really low. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, body composition is your lean body mass and your percent body fat. And so the, the goal, of course, is to have your, you know, a better body composition is more muscle and less fat. Right. That totally makes sense. And so that is a component of fitness, uh, and I, uh, which I guess means that like the fitter you are or, or the process of becoming more fit would mean that you would uh, potentially change your body composition in a term yeah. that, uh, in a direction that, that uh, would be suggested to be positive. So yeah, body recomposition. Yes, <laughs> the, the, changing what people are after that proportion of lean mass to fat, or um, the technical, or the medical term for fat is adipose tissue, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, like, so body recomposition. You could, let's say, you weigh two hundred pounds. You could stay two hundred oh, pounds, right? But lose fat and gain muscle, so that you're absolutely changing your body composition without, you know actually losing any overall weight. Right. That's a really great point. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. It's not necessarily weight. It's just about the, the relative, uh, the relation between these two mm -hmm. sides of like the tissues that make up your body. Mm -hmm. So um, when it comes to something like a yoga practice, and again, we're thinking of modern postural yoga as we know it in the West, but we also know that within that category yoga, there are many different types of yoga. There's like gentle yoga restorative yoga and then there are um yeah well, i think that's that are more active super important right to lay this out yes right that like yoga is not just one thing and sometimes people have this idea especially people who aren't as familiar with it like i said earlier i think people sometimes think yoga is like sitting and meditating which um, it could be it could be absolutely but it can also be or, so yeah or it could be that. one part it could be the whole practice. It could be part of the practice. It could not be part of the practice. That's right. <laughs> You're so right. 
it can ha yeah it can really vary when it comes to qualities like these but yoga can also be quite a, a vigorous practice and i'm just saying vigorous like this is kind of more casual sense because i know when I, it comes no, to I, exercise i think i think that there's there is some research yeah sure but i think right. there is some research showing that very a very vigorous vinyasa flow could constitute maybe not the most vigorous maybe you're not going to get up to maximal intensity but right at, at, at the very least um what would be what would constitute a moderate intensity yeah precisely so um yeah so with that said just this appreciation that yoga is kind of a broad umbrella but um may, maybe i think it's pretty obvious that gentle styles of yoga and restorative and um yin i mean they're they're not those are not um very intense as far as their uh, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the challenge that's involved. There is, you know, there is the element of stretching and flexibility. We're going to get to that on our list. So maybe right. we can't say that, or we're not going to say that those, you know, the styles of yoga are not exercised by that definition. But when we're talking about maybe most of the rest of these categories, categories, maybe we're kind of thinking of the, the more active styles of yoga. Let, let's you know, do that. Flow classes, vinyasa classes, power yoga, you know, ashtanga, that style I mentioned. Yoga mm -hmm. classes that have us up and around and moving, you know, changing mm -hmm. joint position. That's kind of what we're, <laughs> maybe we can just, yeah, set that out. That that's mostly what we're talking about here. So with regard to body composition, uh, and we don't have to get into this in too much detail, but just with your understanding, Travis, of like um, the intensity involved in a, in a yoga practice, as we just described, do you think it could potentially have um, an effect on body composition or not, not really? I do. I think. Yeah more so for a beginner you know somebody who's been yeah. very sedentary and is now taking on a yoga practice um, because in order to change your body composition you have to lose fat and build muscle so that's right this, we'll, we'll probably yeah this kind of leads into these other yeah components, right yeah like well what is the muscle building capacity there's there's some right. Uh, especially when you talk about a more vigorous practice. That's right. Um, and then if you're, if you're, well, the, the complicating factor on this is that to recomposition or to, to lose fat and in particular lose body weight, you have to operate in a caloric deficit. Right. So that's like you have diet. to expend more calories than you, yeah, than you consume or you have to, con yeah. <laughs> that's right. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah that was correct. <laughs> Expend so, more calories than you uh, take, take in. in. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that would and be that's to lose from weight. A yoga and that's, that's yeah, yeah. That a yoga practice. If you it, it, that's more related to nutrition. Yeah. Whatever you are doing from a physical movement practice can help with the caloric expenditure. But anyway, you, it's a long winded say of winded way of saying that it can help to a degree, but not it's not going to be like a not game a changer direct. for body composition. <laughs> I think that's a great way. Yeah. Would you say that maybe um, yoga could maybe play a role in a much bigger picture of um, if someone had a goal of changing their body composition, but like you said, it's probably all, all in a Sure. It's if if like that were your it. primary goal, then that wouldn't be the movement practice necessarily that I would take up. <laughs> I think that's a good way to or, 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 or yeah. make, make my primary is right. More... There are other, there are other types of exercise that could be more helpful with that or more efficient mm -hmm. at that. Mm -hmm. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully we've addressed body composition. Uh, what's next on our list of, of components strength. of fitness? Yes. Muscle, muscle strength. strength. <laughs> uh, so muscular strength is uh, second on this list of components of fitness that ACM puts, uh, ACSM puts out, but that you also see just all over the place. So muscular strength, uh, what is that? Travis. That is your ability to produce force. Right. So muscles, uh, they contract. And when they do so, they produce force. And that can end up moving parts of our body around. Like muscles are attached to bones and they can move our bones around. Or if we're holding objects, uh, then our muscles help us move like the weight of our bones and the weight of those objects around. So uh, muscular strength is like a measure of of how much force a muscle can produce or a measure of force production. And um, when we're talking about like muscular strength as a component of fitness, it's like 
how much strength do you have? And um, like, is the exercise modality in question that you're looking at, does it have the ability to increase muscular strength or to be strengthening? That's what I think would be important to consider when you're trying to decide or determine whether a whether a um, exercise modality could contribute to this component of fitness, do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So then does yoga, as we've been describing it, build strength? And I does think it... listeners of our podcast could <laughs> probably, probably answer that question. I mean, if we've, they've been we've talked about to... this. Yeah, we've talked mm -hmm. about this before, right? So yeah. it, the, the answer is similar to the body composition thing of if you're a beginner, Mm -hmm. then sure uh because like if down dog is hard for you mm -hmm. and you're doing down dog and you're you're building up your ability to hold it from maybe you couldn't hold it at all at first to now you can mm -hmm. hold it for five seconds um then Deep sure breaths. yeah then that would constitute strengthening mm -hmm. uh and then beyond the beginner level if you're working with really challenging poses arm balances mm -hmm. um inversions chaturanga uh, maybe Vinyasas. sure yeah well yeah I, I maybe that's even like the intermediate level um mm -hmm. if if you're improving your ability to do chaturanga then you're certainly by definition getting stronger right once you're beyond that level into like, let's say an advanced Ashtanga practice where you're doing some crazy mm -hmm. strength type maneuvers, absolutely strengthening. But it's not, again, if you said, well, what's the best, most direct way to improve strength? It's not a body weight movement practice. <laughs> uh, it would be a, a movement practice like powerlifting or, or any sort of resistance training strength right. training where you can more easily and systematically use heavier right. and heavier weights because with the body weight movement practice it's just what your body weight is so mm -hmm. in order to make it harder you have to manipulate something you know your relationship of your body relative to gravity uh or just choose harder poses mm -hmm. which is cer certainly viable options and even in the uh, a non yoga context, there's an entire movement practice called calisthenics, That's which right. is all about body up. weight, um, practices, but with calisthenics, we're talking about like pull-ups and muscle ups and front levers, human and flags, human flags. Like these are, these are very strong planches. Poses yeah. There are a lot of them are arm balances or, or, or things involving a pull-up bar. Uh, and they're very but deliberate. It, like you have to really structure your training in a very deliberate sense to build that type of strength. Yeah. So anyway, that's a long explanation for, yes, yoga can absolutely build strength. It's not necessarily the best or most, it doesn't lend itself the best to building strength, but that's you can right. certainly, beginners certainly build strength. And then there are ways to manipulate the practice towards more strength building. That's right. So yoga has the potential to be strengthening and there are certain examples in which it certainly can be, but because it only utilizes at least, at, body weight. At least for certain movements and for certain That's right. um, muscle groups in particular. That's a re really good thing to point out too, because just the sheer fact that it's a body weight practice means that it, it can't strengthen us in a, in a well-rounded way, like in a, in a quote balanced way. Uh, because we just certainly don't have, uh, we simply don't have certain movements available to us on the mat that would strengthen these like um, other muscle groups that simply pushing your body away from the floor, which is like what yoga yeah. does is great. So, but, so it's yeah. strengthening, but in only a subset of the possible ways that one could strengthen or the possible areas of the body. That's right. So it's not strengthening us in a whole body sense. It's not strengthening all major muscle groups. Uh, which I know that's one of the official recommendations that like a strengthening practice should strengthen all, all major muscle groups. Um, so and then we'll, we'll half check this box. It will have, but it's also not progressive uh, in terms of it always being your body weight. So it doesn't have that element of progressive overload. Un unless body composition is going the wrong direction. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Or do you mean um, weight? Actually, actually not. It's really not, not body, body composition. composition. Yeah, the, the, you, it, that that could be a byproduct. But yeah, if you're if you're getting heavier as you're doing it, then 
Yeah. And you'll increase your resistance. It's totally yeah, But now you're, by the definition, you might be getting less fit. Right. But most, uh, most yogis, the way that like typical yoga classes practice at yoga studios here in the West, um, for most yogis, they will get to a point, and it doesn't usually take that long, where they generally tend to plateau in terms of strength gains. To the extent that there were strength trains for uh, strength gains for them to begin with, those will plateau with enough time because, um, yeah, because in general, we don't incorporate the principle of progressive overload into yoga. Um, and so, yeah, so the strength that is there is is limited in terms of because we plateau and it's also not well rounded uh, in terms of all major muscle groups. So, as you said, Travis, yeah, I think we can half check this box. I would I would even say maybe less than half check it. A quarter 30, check. 30 percent check, 25 okay. percent check this box. OK, <laughs> um, but like you said, we tend to talk about this a lot, especially with our strength for yoga work and people who followed our work probably are familiar with us with like these points that one can make about this. So that's muscular strength, which is a measure of force production. It's like how much force uh, a muscle can produce. Now there's a third component of uh, physical fitness that is on like all the lists. And that is muscular endurance, which is different from muscle strength. They're related, right? But muscular endurance is actually something different. What's mm -hmm. muscular endurance? Muscular endurance is your ability to produce a sub-maximal force for a sustained amount of time. So if strength was more about maximal force production for typically a more finite or shorter period of time, now we're talking about your ability to sustain uh, a given force production that's less than your max. So right. so maybe maybe if a hundred maybe if let's say you can do um one deadlift with a hundred pounds. That's your like max. that's your max. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be your strength. That would be strength. Right? Then, mm -hmm. how many repetitions can you do with sixty pounds? Right, a lighter. That weight. would be uh yeah. So that's sixty percent of your max, and mm -hmm. you could probably do I don't know, ten, twelve, fifteen, twenty, whatever it is. So right. it's it's you're doing it for a number of repetitions or a more prolonged hold time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's pretty obvious to me that yoga does <laughs> build muscular yes. endurance. Like a lot of, a lot of the efforts are to hold poses or positions for longer. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I totally agree. Yeah. I think based on my understanding of muscular endurance and what it is and what you need to do to improve it, a yoga practice seems like it could be pretty good. Of course, it's like certain movements and in certain ways and certain muscle groups, but yeah, it does I just seem... think of I just think of chair. Yes, chair pose, Ujkatasana. Like, yes. Yeah, like how long can you hold this? It's always exactly like, that, yeah. that, like I want to stop holding this, but hold it longer, and then like right in that that feeling, that burning sensation, that's building muscular endurance. Absolutely, I think plank pose is another good example to throw yeah. out when we're talking about like um, if someone could not do plank pose, meaning like say not hold like quote full plank pose in good form or like the form that we're looking mm -hmm. for. If someone doesn't have that ability and there are plenty of people who, who can't, that yeah. would be a measure of like strength in that. I would, you know, cause that's yeah. just like, can you hold, yeah. do you have the strength to hold the position? Once you build the strength to hold plank and you can align yourself the way we're looking for, um, then when you're talking about holding longer and longer plank, like let's try to hold 30 seconds, let's hold a minute. We're getting much less on the end of the spectrum, which is maximum strength, which is that other category we talked about. And then, then we're more on the on the end of the spectrum, which is muscular endurance. Yeah. Right. And it's just yeah. Holding and longer. I think that's this is a very common way where we use our language too loosely, where yeah. we'll say, all right, we're holding plank for longer. We're getting stronger that's in our right. plank. We're really not getting stronger in our plank. We're getting building muscular endurance. That's right. Or or maybe another way I like to think of it is strength endurance. So like we uh -huh. have the strength to mm. hold the plank and mm -hmm. now we're sustaining that strength over a longer period of time. But it's really in the most accurate sense of the term muscular endurance, not strength. Totally. If if we're go if we're holding plank for a minute, let's say. That's right. You're not you're not getting strong. even truly anything longer than like 10 or 20 seconds is at is at that point endurance. Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And so muscular strength in terms of maximum strength, 
and muscular endurance, which is submaximal force production, but over a longer period of time, they are related, but they're, they're different. Yeah. And, well, uh, the, other, the other interesting thing is like, let's say, but going back to that deadlift example, if I can deadlift a hundred pounds once, then let's say I can deadlift 60 pounds, 15 times. But if I can deadlift 200 pounds once, then I'll be able to deadlift 60 pounds a lot more times. Or, yeah. oh, that's a really or if good you point. went the other way, like if I can only deadlift 70 pounds and now I'm trying to deadlift 60 pounds, like how many times are gonna, am I going to be able to do it? Maybe two or three. So the more strength you have like at the maximum more strength yeah the more maximum strength you have the more the lower a percentage any other number is relative to your max so that's right if you're if you're stronger than your ability to sustain a given sub maximal contraction will be greater so they <laughs> they tie into each other that totally makes sense which is Building, why mm -hmm. when we build strength in a strength for yoga off mat context. And then we go back to the mat and we're like, oh, wow, look at how much easier it is to hold chair pose for yeah. five, 10 breaths. It's not because we practiced, well, maybe there was a little bit of endurance, muscular endurance training involved, but we, we really focus on that strength element. It's just that yeah. our ceiling has been raised. So yeah. any, um, any effort below that, it represents a, a smaller percentage of our ceiling. Yeah. So it just feels less effortful. It feels less like hard. And, mm -hmm. um, that's a way in which a strength training practice practice can help a yoga practice feel more easeful, uh, which is kind of what we're all about with our strength for yoga offering, which is like a separate practice than a yoga practice designed to like really effectively build strength in all the ways, like balance strength, all the major muscle groups. And then that helps support a yoga. It raises our ceiling, like you said. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so I guess with this component of muscular endurance, we can, we would suggest that yoga can improve muscular endurance. Like it could check that box, but of course this is limited, right? It's, yeah. you know, uh, to maybe, the, yeah. Maybe again, recognizing that it's only a certain subset of all of the movements and muscles that one could mm -hmm. build muscular that's endurance right. in. Yes. So that's maybe, right. maybe it doesn't get a full check of the box. <laughs> 60 percent, like, 50. Yeah. I was going to say three quarters, but maybe I was being too generous. <laughs> right. And then I was just thinking, as you said that, like so many other forms of exercise that may contribute to improving muscular endurance, they, it's probably the same with all of them. Like they're only going to improve them to, to improve that quality to the extent that you move your body, you know, the muscles that you're moving and the movements that you're moving them in. Like that's not really yeah. specific True. just to yoga or a limitation of yoga alone as compared to other forms of movement or forms of exercise. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so yeah, it does, it can improve. And I've seen, there's actually research on, um, on a yoga, yoga practice and its connection to muscular endurance. And I've certainly seen studies which have suggested that it can do that. So cool. <laughs> uh, next on the list, number four on our list of components of fitness is a biggie. It's one that I think many people just, that's the default that they think of when they think of exercise. And that is cardiorespiratory fitness or cardiovascular endurance. Like these are kind of synonyms or, mm -hmm. or what we might loosely just call cardio, right? Like cardio mm -hmm. exercise uh, and cardio exercise or cardiovascular exercise is also sometimes called aerobic or often called aerobic exercise. I think Travis, like we kind of know aerobic action, like most of us just kind of know it. It's like when our uh, breath pace increases, when we sweat, when our heart rate goes up, um, and when we feel like we're kind of, uh, sustaining, so not high intensity levels of effort, because that would be more like, like strengthening, like Matt, that's high intensity would be strength is an example of high intensity. It's not the only one, but cardio would be like a lower intensity than that. Uh, but, but held for like a stain, a sustained amount of time. Cardio, mm -hmm. would you say, does that, does that kind of, would you agree with that, uh, definition? Uh, examples uh, of cardio. Yes. <laughs> examples of cardiovascular exercise would be like running or jogging or swimming or cycling. These are kind of some classic examples. But what about I, I... yoga? <laughs> Thanks for asking that question. Um, what about yoga? Well, first of all, when we're talking about cardiovascular exercise, it's, it's good to know that cardiovascular exercise can be um, categorized based on level of intensity. 
And uh, it's based on what I've looked into, it seems like generally it's considered there's light intensity, moderate intensity, and vigorous intensity cardiovascular exercise. But yeah. I've also you seen can, like very light thrown in. Yeah, there. you can break it into five. Right. You can break it into as many as you want. You exactly. could break it into 15. Right, the, right, the, totally. The Borg scale, right? Right. Oh, right. That's, that's, yeah, the Borg scale, exactly. So yeah, there are all these different ways you could break up like how intense your cardiovascular exercise is, but it's generally like it's this level of intensity that I think matters when we're talking about whether an exercise modality can can check that box, right? Mm -hmm. And generally, uh, what's our understanding around what level of intensity a, an aerobic activity would need to be in order to check the box of being like, yeah, usually that component of fitness? Usually the minimum is moderate. That's my understanding too. Yeah. And so there are many ways to measure a moderate intensity activity. Mm -hmm. One of the simplest is if you were to imagine your activity ranging in intensity on a six to 20 scale, which we call the Borg scale. Right. You mentioned if that you a were to ago. rate your perceived exertion where six would be nothing You're not and doing 20 anything. would be all out, then yeah somewhere in the 12 to 14 range would be what we would define as moderate intensity. And the reason why the scale goes from six to 20 and not one to 15, let's yeah, say, was, actually there's a mod, this. there's a modified Borg scale that does go one to 10. But the, um, the reason that they pick six to 20 is that roughly correlates with what your heart rate is oh. at that intensity. So if your resting heart rate is around 60 and you're the maximum heart rate that your heart rate could get up to is around 200. Now that that's number different is different for everybody based on mm -hmm. your age and some other things, but loosely speaking, if you add a 10 to the Borg, then that would be oh, there you go. equivalent yeah. to what six your heart to rate is there. So yeah. if six to 20 is the range and 12 to 14 is moderate, then that works out to a heart rate of about 120 to 140 beats per minute. Okay. And that's the same moderate range that's usually given for percentage uh, or, or for, for heart rate. So heart rate, uh, you, I, I've also seen it like 120 to 150. Again, mm -hmm. it totally depends on what your resting heart rate is and right. what your be max different. heart rate are. And there are more complicated equations that you can do to figure out, well, what's my, what would be moderate for me? Uh, right. But anyway, just very generally and loosely speaking, moderate is 120 to 140, 150 beats per minute or 12 to 14 on this uh, scale of rating of perceived exertion. And there are other ways to measure it, um, mm -hmm. such as measuring oxygen consumption and doing a right. percentage of the maximum oxygen consumption. And that's um, uh, like a measurement of your VO2 max. Is that right? Right. Your volume yeah, of so oxygen, like your maximum volume that your body can... Um, yeah. Uh, what's the word? Uh, Use. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so heart rate and VO2 correlate pretty well at mm -hmm. low exercise intensities, I believe, but things get wonky at higher intensities, uh, but it's, it's sense. easier to measure heart rate. Like our right. watches can do that now, right? <laughs> exactly. to, to some degree of accuracy, but, um, to measure VO2, you actually have to wear a mask and be attached right. to, um, a gas exchange. That's right. Apparatus. And something that I think is interesting about the measurement of uh, volume of oxygen consumed or consume was the word I was looking for earlier, how much oxygen your body is consuming during exercise is that, um, you know, when we're looking at breath like that, there's inhalation and exhalation, which sometimes we casually call respiration, but technically that's ventilation. That's like the mechanical movement of air in and out of your lungs. But um, when you're actually consuming oxygen and when we're talking about VO2 and VO2 max, that's a cellular respiration. So that's actually like that gas exchange of um, oxygen being delivered to like your working muscles on that cellular level. So that's kind of the level. I think it's easy to think it's like um, that our breath in and out is like what we're measuring there and that you increase your breath your breath rate, like as you increase exercise, but it's more about that cellular level of respiration and not um, ventilation, which is that inhale and exhale of air. So I think that's, that distinction is interesting. So when we're talking about like cardiorespiratory fitness and VO2 max, it's like at, at that level, that's what that oxygen mask is measuring for us. Mm -hmm. 
And, and maybe the now that we've given the most complicated way of <laughs> measuring it, we could also mention the talk test. Yes, which is like the easiest way, right, of yeah. measuring. Yeah. Uh, do, do you want to tell us what the talk test is? Yeah. So so there's the talk test and then there's the singing test or the sing test. But the talk test is just, can you carry on a conversation? Um, and so the the intensity of the activity is if you're able to carry on a conversation, but you're not able to sing, then you're doing moderate intensity exercise. Ooh, I like that. If you're, I hadn't heard the sing part. That's yeah. Really so cool. if you're if you can neither talk, hold, carry on a conversation, nor sing, um, then you're that's in, that's a very vigorous. vigorous. Yeah. Right. But it, but if you can't sing, but you can t still talk, then that's moderate. Got okay. Yeah. But if you can just talk. Like if you're just, if you're um, out on a walk with a friend and you guys, you're walking and you're talking, um, but talking isn't like somewhat challenging, then that may not qualify as like moderate, uh, moderate level yeah. of intensity. Because you can talk yeah. and it's not, uh, you know. Or so if you could sing, if you t can talk and sing. Right. Then okay, there you go. Around, then that would be not meeting the, 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 the threshold for moderate. That would Got it. So that might be considered light or very light intensity, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So establishing that uh, various uh, cardiovascular type exercises can be divided into their different levels of intensity. And if what we're looking for is for something to kind of be qualified as improving cardiorespiratory fitness, it's, it seems like we want that moderate range. Right. Right, right. Um, I know that research has looked into this with regard to yoga and a yoga practice. And my understanding is it's been, it's, they're kind of mixed results. And it also really would come down to, again, what type of yoga we're looking at, even within the category of yoga that we've kind of defined that we're talking about today. Even within that, um, there's like power, there's like, you know, nonstop, really fast paced power yoga. And then there, uh, maybe Iyengar yoga, where you are up and moving, but you're not really moving very fast and things like that. So they actually, really depend. they measure that in the research based on how quickly you're moving through the poses, right? That's right. Yeah. Like if you're holding, yeah. if you're doing a sun salutation and you're holding the poses for what, three seconds or I forget what it was. Yeah. I'm not sure that I remember. I just know that I anyway. was looking at a study that looked at, yeah, moving through sun salutations at a faster pace. Mm -hmm. Um, expended more energy than moving through the sun citations at a, at a slower pace. So pace mm -hmm. definitely comes into it. Yeah. And when we talk about the different, like what yoga can look like, it can really, it can really vary. So my understanding based on the research that I have seen, uh, various studies, it seems that more fast paced types of yoga could be considered in the moderate, uh, in the moderate category, but like maybe just like kind of barely. Um, but, but it seems like most yoga that's looked at in these terms kind of falls more in that light intensity. Mm -hmm. So kind of light to moderate. And of course, of course it depends. Another factor that it depends on is the individual physical fitness of the person doing the practice. That's huge. Yeah. So, so somebody who's more fit going through the same speed of that sun salutation, it's, it's, that's right. It depends on the person. <laughs> And, and what their fitness is. Right, it's it's right. going to be closer to maximal or ma maybe it's going to be a higher percentage, let's say of someone's VO2 or their heart mm -hmm, rate mm -hmm. uh, of their max heart rate compared to someone else who's more fit. Someone who is less fit will be operating at a higher intensity for the same objective right. mm -hmm. activity as someone with different fitness. Yeah. And if you're talking about like a yoga class where everyone's in there doing ostensibly the same objective activity, I mean, we know different people can you know, move slightly differently, or maybe they don't do the poses in the exact same way, but from the, you know, the looking at that container from the outside in, they're kind of doing the same objective yeah. practice. And so, yeah, so it really depends on the individual and how yeah. much. And there, there's actually one more, I know we already gave like eight different ways of measuring it, but <laughs> there. <laughs> There's one more, and I think that this is helpful in yes. contextualizing the intensity. So the the final way of measuring the intensity of activity is called a metabolic equivalent, mm -hmm. which is abbreviated as MET or MET. 
That's and right. so one met is the oxygen requirement at rest. So right. uh, how much oxygen you're consuming just sitting around. And everything else is measured off multiples of the met. So mm -hmm. it, it usually ranges from like one to six, where six or higher would be a very vigorous metabolic right. um, equivalent. So Hatha yoga is there's it there there are tables of these things where they're giving tons of activities and then They've different ratings these. so yeah. yeah so one one table that we found rated hatha yoga at 2.5 and rated power yoga at 4.0 right. and so well you might say so well really what is 2.5 and 4 and so 2.5 is comparable to cleaning your house and 4 is comparable to leisure cycling Oh, right, right. And that's important to yeah, make that distinction. And um, I had read that in order for in these terms, in terms of METs, in order for a physical activity to be considered a moderate, like a moderate intensity level, it needs to be like around three METs or higher, like three yeah, to yeah. 5.9. You said six yeah. and above is like vigorous, but yeah. three to 5.9 is like moderate. So then Hatha Yoga is just below, but Power Yoga would be within that range. That's and right. That makes yeah. sense to me. Yeah, I think that's actually kind of in line with what what um, we were saying earlier. That it just it seems like the research suggests that yoga can be anywhere from light to moderate, depending on the style, the pace, and the individual. But like light to moderate. Yeah. So um, does yeah. does does yoga improve your cardio? I th to me it seems like a really similar conversation to the strength one. In terms of, you know, if you're if you're very unfit cardiovascularly and you start a yoga practice uh, that challenges you that way, I would think it would improve your cardiovascular fitness, but only to a point and then you're going to adapt. And then if you continue to yeah, do Yeah, like right, how quickly can you do your sun salutations? That's right. Like you just keep doing them. And also if you're in a class, you're doing them at the pace the teacher is leading. You know, for yeah. the most part, you're probably not going to just do them super fast and the person next to you is doing them more. Is that... Like, is that what the competition in India is? They give you like 30 sure. minutes and say, how many, how many sun salutations that would be can you so, do in 30 minutes? Um, I don't know a ton about the yoga competitions in India, but my oh. impression is it's more about how well do you do the pose? Like, are you? Mm. That's ah, it's more like a artistic ra yeah. rating. Yeah. Like how okay. deep can you get or things like that. But I shouldn't say it much because I don't know that. I just know they exist, Got it. Um, but I don't know that much about them uh but anyway yeah yes yeah. so do you agree that like yoga could improve um, markers of like cardiorespiratory fitness to a point but again we may plateau um but mm -hmm. but maybe maintenance is fine you know there's always there's also yeah. the question of just like how much do you always need to be progressing like maybe you keep doing yoga keeps yeah you at can, the level can that this you're at. can this maintain mm -hmm. a certain level sure that's right. Yeah. So that's, um, I think that's an interesting factor to consider as well. But I think just if we were to step back and sum it up, it seems like uh, yoga, like active styles of yoga could be considered light to moderate. Um, but it, it really kind of depends. So depending on your goals, then you could like maybe use that information to inform, inform you in your yoga practice and your movement practice in general. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, cool. So that's cardiorespiratory fitness, taking a look at that component of it. So that's our fourth, right? That's our fourth on the list. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the fifth. So as, as I mentioned earlier, the ACSM, that governing body in terms of exercise, they lay out five components of fitness. We're about to talk about the fifth. But then we, you and I, Travis, have added on a few additional that, um, that are relevant and seem like they totally make sense to talk about here. But as far as ACSM goes, there is a final fifth component of fitness. And that's flexibility. <laughs> that's flexibility. And I think that that's interesting and important for us. Obviously, flexibility plays a big role in yoga. Obviously, also, we've talked about this on the podcast before, but um, it's a little controversial as to whether flexibility should, like some people don't think it should be included as a component of fitness. Like that Nuzo paper from, I think, 2020, where he argued for retiring flexibility as a component of fitness. Yeah, it's so just a some, hot take. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's a hot, exactly. A hot research take. No, he oh. he obviously had good, good rationale for it. But right, it, he kind of laid that all out. He maybe he retired it, but it hasn't been retired yet from these. It's other. an 
That's totally right. That's right. It's like his opinion. He's arguing for it, but it has not been retired. So as of right now, as of recording date, flexibility he's like, is. He's like Tom Brady. What? Do you know who Tom Brady is? I do. Sometimes I don't know who the people are, the athletes are in the question, but <laughs> Tom, Tom, Brady Tom Brady is. retired for like five oh, minutes right. and, then, and then came back. That's right. So flexibility heard, was retired for like a week when the Nuzzo paper came out. That's really but funny. It came back. It's still there. Yeah. So flexibility is a component of fitness. And we mentioned earlier when we were suggesting we were going to kind of not include gentle styles of yoga, such as now we can. And yin. Right. Well, and just gentle in general. Yin for sure. Right. Mm-hmm. Or uh, like restorative. Are we really doing much? Um, I think we can, I think that it depends on how you're defined. This probably gets into too many weeds for this conversation. Or, or maybe maybe gentle is the one where you would say, well, that's probably not. Probably not. Increasing Wait. your flexibility. Oh, one why not? Where you're totally where you're totally just passively, you know, you have resting a lot of bolsters. on bolsters. That would yeah. be that's restorative. Yeah. In my opinion, um, if you're bolstered, you are passively resting. But if you're resting in a position in which some tissues are being lengthened, I think okay. that is still a stretch, okay. I would think. And restorative does. I mean, it's so it's not like yin. In yin yoga, you're really, it's like there are no right. pops. And you're going really to the end range and the sensation is tends to be intense. And that is different from restorative. But depending on what you think of stretching, like how you're defining it, to me, it's like as long as some tissues are being lengthened, which that's a pretty broad definition. I mean, that could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Right. So, yeah, I would think that restorative could uh, could contribute to flexibility, maybe yin a little more. I mean, I just, again, that's maybe a little too into the weeds for this conversation. But gentle yoga also, again, it kind of depends on what that looks like. But I teach gentle classes I call gentle in my online class library, and they certainly incorporate a lot of moving in and out of end range. So I would think, um, I think as long as you're, you know, as long as you're visiting end range on like a regular basis, that could be considered a stretch. So mm-hmm. I, I would suggest we could throw those styles of yoga in with the more active styles when we're talking about flexibility. Right, right. As a component of fitness. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. So to me, it's, I mean, I, we have, we actually have a lot of research that definitively shows that yoga does improve flexibility. We kind of like know that. <laughs> so I guess to the extent that yoga. Did we, do, did we define, I th- we, I think oh. we sort of defined it in passing, but. Define it's, flexibility. It's of course your your maximal range of motion. That's right. Joint, right. That's what flexibility is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you for defining it for us. You're right. We did. We were just like assuming that we all know what flexibility yeah, I, is. We I think we do, but we we so uh, thoroughly defined. meticulously detail <laughs> uh, defined everything else that we might as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. So yeah, and flexibility when it's measured like in a lab that uses um, a specific tool called a goniometer, right? that like measures mm-hmm. joint angles. And so that's kind of like how, how flexibility is measured um, in like a, a laboratory type setting. But like for us, practically in a yoga mat, it's just like how far you can move a joint mm-hmm. would be flexibility. Yeah. So maybe just in the interest of time, maybe we can just say, yes, yoga does check this box of flexibility in terms of a component fair. of fitness. Yeah. And maybe because we have a few more uh, items on our list, we could be, we could be good on flexibility and move on. I feel good about that. (laughs) Okay, cool. So that ends the five basic components according to ACSM. We have others to look at. And um, we have these two, the next two on the list we have as two separate categories. And I'm wondering, Travis, if you could actually help explain this a little bit. I think now that I'm saying that, I guess I can, I can sort of see how they are different, but we've got speed. They're related. We have power, but they're related. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. We have speed and power. And maybe I shouldn't necessarily just suggest them at the same time, but I just kind of am maybe for the sake of we can. I think we can do them together because the answer is basically the same, right? That's right. Okay. So speed and power, what are, what are they? What are these components of fitness? Speed is how quickly you can move. Mm-hmm. Usually in an athletic context, we're talking about something like sprinting, um, but it could also be just related to how quickly you could move in a different context. Mm-hmm. And I don't think yoga does too much in, and with in that, relation to improving your speed. Would that you're be not, because of that? You're not going to get faster. Well, you're definitely not going to get fast, like become a faster sprinter. From doing well, yoga. 
<laughs> not directly. Not directly. Because yeah. of the principle of specificity, right? Yeah, it just it doesn't look anything. Yoga is usually moving relatively slowly through different poses, right? And even if you That's are right. moving quickly through a sun salutation, it's still not. It's not top speed. It's not that. Yeah, definitely not. That's not top speed, right? Um, and because of the said, the sub principle specific adaptations to impose demands, if we're not moving at top speed on the yoga mat, it, it seems very implausible that a yoga practice would improve our top speed because we're not practicing that, right? Yeah. And I think the same goes for power. So right. power is your ability to produce force at high speed. So that's why they, they go hand in hand or your ability to produce force quickly. And so we already talked about strength mm -hmm. and how yoga is limited mm -hmm. in that power just goes hand in hand with that because now you're asking to produce strength quickly. And that just isn't something that happens very often on a yoga that with the exception, I would say of something like a jump through or a jump back. Jump back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like a those, jump back into chaturanga from like standing forward fold. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think that those, there- There are a few, a on, couple on, exceptions. Yeah. Also yeah. down dog jumping forward to the top of the mat, like feet yes. to hands. Yeah, the, and example? in the scheme of athletic things, not to trivialize those things, because I know that those are not, not everyone, that's not in everybody's practice, right? Um, oh, but right, right. those, so those are things where someone who's starting out doing yoga and then that develops the ability to do those things, they've certainly improved their power, mm -hmm. but there's way more beyond that from a power development standpoint that you can get into in a strength and conditioning context. Absolutely. That makes so, yeah. Power seems like a really big category and maybe yoga, like a, a tiny amount in a couple specific movements, maybe it could contribute toward that. But in general, if someone really wants to improve their power, they should take yeah, on like a, a pow power-based training. Yeah. A good example of power would be like, how high can you jump? Mm -hmm. And again, like yoga doesn't have any jumping no. to my knowledge, <laughs> uh, let alone maximal output. That's right. Jump as high as you can. So I think we can say, and also maybe in the interest of brevity for this conversation, we can say yoga does not meet, does not check the box of speed or power in like a well-rounded, robust manner. Like, no, like it gets like the, like no check mark. Yeah. If it did get a check mark, the check mark for power would be very small. 1%. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. I was going to so, say 10. I was going to say 10, but okay. one's fine too. Well, I'll go with whatever you say. We can average Because you're the exercise science uh, professional here. Fair enough. Um, I decide. Right, right. So that's speed and power. Uh, next on our list, we have something called agility. Agility. Can you tell us what agility is? Agility is the ability to rapidly change the position of the body in space. Mm -hmm. with speed and accuracy so right you have to do it quickly we already said you know you're not <laughs> do, building any speed so if you're not building any speed then you're definitely not building any agility but any, like if we were to go into a little bit more just agility is like changing direction starting and stopping accelerating decelerating and of course moving within the confines of your mat you're really not right developing and in such a that. controlled manner slow controlled manner yeah agility yeah. To maybe me if you were like jumping from side to side on your mat which isn't necessarily something that many nobody ever does yoga that. classes are doing maybe i've seen it like once but that's yeah, not it's not characteristically a, in, no. in a in that practice so it seems I'm to not me checking that, that box. Okay, good, cool. Yeah, on a on a surf superficial level, to me, it seems like agility is more in the realm of like athletics. Seems like it's something that's trained for like sports and things like that. Um, not so much yoga. Mm -hmm. What about uh, next on our list? Coordination. Coordination we could define as the ability to move two or more parts of your body at the same time to achieve a specific goal, or the body's ability to move smoothly and efficiently mm -hmm. and i would say yes <laughs> we've we found another box that could potentially be checked yeah now this is the 
these are the second tier um, mm -hmm. categories. These are not our top five. So right. take right. that for what, what you will. Not everybody <laughs> thinks that coordination is an essential component of fitness. Ah, oh, that totally makes sense. But it still could be considered a component of fitness. Right. By and some. by some. Mm -hmm. Um, based on your definition of coordination, it it, to it does seem to me that we we certainly do that within yoga. Like we're yeah, we're coordinating uh, various parts of our body at the same time, and we're moving with um, absolutely yeah, with uh, with precision in that manner, and like you know, opposite limbs, same time, things like that. That mm -hmm. seems like our general coordination could be improved through that practice. Totally. Um, what about balance, which is next on our list? Absolutely. So balance there, you can look at it a couple of different ways. I think we talked all about this in our first episode on oh, stability. Oh, we did on stability. Yeah, we should link yeah. that in the show notes. But totally. you can you can balance statically without moving, like tree pose. You could mm -hmm. balance dynamically, like if you were stepping back, you were in chair pose and then you were stepping back to high lunge, mm -hmm. let's say. Mm -hmm. Um and then maybe returning back to chair. Right. Um, and then there's stability, which is your ability to resist or recover from a perturbation. Mm -hmm. So, um, that, that maybe is a little less focused on in yoga, but it, it could be like, well, I nearly fell over, but then I, I, I corrected myself so that the perturbation was me stumbling. Um, right, right. But it, I, I think we know balance is a huge component of what we work on or often work on with our, some of our standing balance poses. Absolutely. Like all <laughs> so, of our single leg standing balance poses in yoga. I mean, they're called balance poses. That's yeah. Like one e of the even, um, even high lunge where our feet are kind of not in line, one foot mm -hmm. in front of the other, like a tightrope, but there your, your base is kind of narrow. It's a narrow long, base but it's narrow. Right. Yeah. So now you're, you're certainly developing some stability in the frontal plane from side to side. That's right. I definitely think opposes like high lunge is helping with, with balance for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, or potentially helping with balance. Um, mm -hmm. absolutely. And then I don't know what hand, you think about balancing. <laughs> That's actually so what I was just inversions. about to say. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Arm balances and inversions. That's also balance, but just totally. balancing on your hands. Yeah. So depending on what Which you're thinking of. Most re like apart from gymnastics and, uh, like, I don't know what else. Where else are you getting that? So that's, that's kind a of a really unique good question. Way that yoga calisthenics, and, yeah. And, Which I guess but, that's kind of overlap with gymnastics. Yeah, just few other movement practices could develop or do develop that component of fitness, which is pretty cool. That is really cool and unique to yoga for sure. That's awesome. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're gonna say that uh, balance that that uh, box is checked for yoga. It does help mm -hmm. improve balance. So Travis, I feel like we have kind of thoroughly gone through our list of the various components of fitness and taken a look at, you know, where yoga may check or partially check or not check some boxes. So after kind of going through all of that, I mean, what do you think about the message that we sometimes hear coming out of yoga, which is that like yoga is a complete practice or it could give you everything you might want out of exercise. It's all you need in terms of like a structured movement practice. I think we've sufficiently debunked <laughs> that. That's right, that's right. But also, also you could ask the question like, could any single exercise modality check all of the boxes? Right. Like, does, could that and happen I, anyway? The, the only one that I can think of is CrossFit, mm -hmm. which intends to check all the boxes. Like it was created with the intention of being everything. And right. in reality, because of that, it's not even like it's really one thing because it's everything. Right, because CrossFit includes sense. a bunch of different exercise modalities within it, right? Like it has. Yeah, it has you strength run, training, and you strength it has train gymnastics, and... it has mm -hmm. cardiovascular, uh, it has, actually the CrossFit games are ongoing as we record this podcast. But, oh, no way. Um, yeah, check them out. Uh, but anyway, so that if, if there were something or maybe like, uh, I don't know, decathlon, I don't know what even all the events are in decathlon, but that, that would probably come pretty close. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
but any any th- those are all like hybridizations of other various pursuits, movement right? Modal- yeah, yeah, so exercise, any, any one yeah. any one thing, it's unlikely. Yeah, it just doesn't seem it, it like by the, the nature. Boxes. I mean, how could it? It just they're specific, like these like specific exercises that you adapt mm-hmm. to these to the specific demands of the exercise. So I don't think it's like I don't think it's really fair to try to to assume or try to make that demand of yoga that it be everything. Right. And I totally. think when we yeah, when we really look at yoga and see uh, what it really can offer in these ter- in this movement realm and what it can't, we can then almost like respect our yoga practice more by being more intentional about, you know, yeah. what, what it also makes you wonder, well, okay, so we've talked about how yoga can be strengthening, but only to an extent. And, or we, ha- we have to be really deliberate about making it more so it can develop our cardiovascular system, mm-hmm. but only if we go really fast, like, right. and so then the question is, well, do we want to go through the trouble of trying to make it stronger and trying to make it more cardiovascularly intense because we want to get everything out of it or as much mm-hmm. as we can out of this one thing, right. or can we allow it to be more naturally what it is? Yeah. And then do our strength training and our cardiovascular exercise on the side. Absolutely. And um, it makes me think now that you're saying that, it makes me think of another podcast episode we recorded. Uh, I think it's episode six. Uh, I think the title is, is is Ashtanga Cult. But we really talked about a lot more than just that. And that's kind of one of the things that we talked about as well, which is like for me, when I started learning that like strength as an example was like really important for our bodies just in terms of like health benefits. Um, but, and, and I also realized that yoga didn't really do a great job of offering strength, at least in a long-term and a well-balanced manner. I went through a phase where I really tried to make my yoga practice stronger and kind of just, I was trying to force yoga to make this offering to my body that, uh, that I now realize it's just not really the best vehicle for that, for like true long-term progressive strength. And by stepping away and embracing like a separate structured strength practice, I was then able to kind of have that my component of fitness in those terms met by this great practice that's designed specifically to do that. And then yoga was freed up for me to be all the all the things that it does, like you said, um, naturally so well. And I wasn't putting this pressure on this mm-hmm. one. Pra- I think that I think sometimes yogis. We just, can't, we just like yoga is a very beloved practice, and it's so meaningful in so many ways. I mean, clearly it's. It's just a, there's, it's a multifaceted practice that can play a major role in our lives. And I understand the tendency for us to, to just want it to be our everything. You know, we want to be able just to be like, do yoga seven days a week and it checks all of our boxes. But, Mm -hmm. um, so I understand the tendency, but I think once we get a little more intentional and really look a little more at the, the science and the evidence that's there as far as, um, movement and all these components go, then we can just like do a better job of, um, respecting and appreciating yoga by not trying to make it everything. Yeah. But also recognizing, as we know, like some people aren't willing to undertake anything outside of yoga practice. And when that is the case, well, there are ways that we can manipulate the practice to try to reap these other benefits, which we know to be important to a well-rounded fitness. That's true. Um, practice right which yeah absolutely so it's so not like best the, yeah. best case scenario you do other stuff cross training cross training uh, yes but if you're not gonna then <laughs> and a lot of people I, won't you know it's okay to acknowledge that and that's fine and then well how can we adapt this to try to make it more well-rounded that's a great point i think we have a lot of examples of people who they're just not interested you know we know um Okay, so there are there are official guidelines for how much exercise, like quantity and quality of exercise that are recommended for humans to do in order to like maintain um, health and reduce risk of disease. So just general health recommendations. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, and we'll, we'll state what those are. But uh, I think we also know that it's, it's something like um, 80% of people do not meet those minimum requirements, like 80%. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who um, they don't exercise at all, as we talked about earlier in this conversation, like the, you know, amount that you exercise versus like sedentary time, blah, blah, blah. So for some, for some people, for many people, like doing a yoga class three times a week for them, they consider that like, that's, that's their exercise. 
-hmm. And um, when that's the case, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for for the, those yoga classes to maybe offer, you know, try to offer more to help those people meet um, additional additional needs. Yep. But Tra Travis, what are the official exercise recommendations? Yeah, so the the recommendations are put out by the ACSM as well as the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, mm -hmm. and they recommend for healthy adults. So these are people between eighteen and sixty five that they should participate in 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity, mm -hmm. which they say you could break it up into 30 minutes, five days a week. Um, but I've also seen recommendations that you could do it in bouts as short as 10 minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be 30 minute chunks. Or they say you can do vigorous intensity activity for a minimum of 20 minutes on three days a week. And I actually, I've also seen 75 I've minutes seen 75 as too, the, yeah. the minimum. Yeah, so, 75 so maybe, for maybe vigorous. Maybe 25. But the, so 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous or some combination thereof mm -hmm. that equates to, right. you know, Is it e e equals out to that. And that, the, again, the, those are minimums. So yeah. they say you could go up as much as 300 or more minutes of moderate intensity or as much as 150 minutes or more of vigorous intensity so that it's a range that you get more benefits the more you do. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that physical activity, that I should have specified that that was all aerobic. Cardiovascular, yeah. Yeah. They also recommend two days a week of strength training for all of the major muscle groups. That's right. That's right. I think we often hear the 150 minutes of, um, of exercise and we, and, and I, I feel like I less often hear about the two days of strength training, but that's yeah. equally there. It's like both. It's like 150 of cardio and two day, at least two days a week of strength training or resistance training. That's the yep. official recommendation to maintain health reduced risk of disease and all that huge abundance of benefits that come from exercise. Right. I mean, the list is like so right. long right? of all the benefits that exercise has to offer us like health wise. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess maybe we can just kind of wrap, wrap up this conversation by just, my question would be, so could a yoga practice do you, as it, as it's typically seen, as we typically see it practice, can it meet those general health recommendations? of 150 minutes of moderate plus two days a week of resistance training. Like if all you did was yoga, does mm -hmm. it check? So this isn't so much the components of fitness we're talking about anymore, but just these general recommendations, you know what I mean? It's going to be, that's going to be tough. <laughs> that's what I, that's my thinking as well. <laughs> yes. Because if you're talking about 150 minutes, which if you're taking 50 minute yoga classes, that's three. But the a fifty minute yoga class, the whole thing isn't moderate intensity. No, it's, it's not. It's probably low intensity interspersed with moderate. Unless you're just going nuts, you know, you're doing a one and a half hour practice where the middle fifty minutes of it are just right. Brutally, then you, get, then you would catch the fifty. <laughs> yeah, but I don't. I don't think that that's super well designed for that purpose. I agree. Yeah, I don't think it's super well designed for that purpose, and it's not. I mean, we've got. I don't know how many people practice yoga on a regular basis, but like there, uh, I don't think very many instances in which we see people practicing yoga, are they at meeting like what you're describing? Like that's like kind of, that would be kind of rare. Like in general, like we said, research suggests in general, yoga could be classified as light to moderate um, as far as aerobic yeah, activity it's, goes. It's on the left. If, so if you just said, well, I don't care about the moderate intensity part, I'm just going to do 150 minutes a week. Well, sure. If you take three hour long classes and that's, that's what you do, you're, you're <laughs> being that's... active, but are you, but you might, yeah. it might be lighter than what the, these governing bodies are recommending. That's right. Intensity that's... wise. Exactly. Intensity wise. However, um, even a very light intensity yoga practice, you know, even just like, it's not very challenging, but you're still there, you're on the mat, you're moving. That's still going to be like, that's non sedentary time, right? Like you could definitely think of if we're thinking, I mean, I don't know if you could loosely, we talked about the difference between exercise and non exercise activity thermogenesis or um, eat versus meat maybe you could cons like throw like a very mellow yoga class that doesn't maybe it's not it's not very intense but you're still moving 
And therefore you're not sitting on the couch. You're not like um, sitting, just sitting and being sedentary. That's still movement. And we know that that still can be beneficial for us. Yeah. It's, it's exercise by the definition that we described mm -hmm. earlier. It just doesn't meet the recommendations for how intense exercise <laughs> uh, should be yeah. each week. You know, thanks for clarifying that. That's so true. Yeah. And with regard to that official recommendation of two days a week of resistance training or strength training for all major muscle groups, I think we also established that yoga cannot, cannot meet because we don't, it's yeah. not balanced strength. It's only strength in certain directions and with certain mm -hmm. muscles. Good so point. that doesn't mean that yoga is not worth, I mean, obviously we all know how much we love yoga and it has so many benefits to offer uh, above and beyond everything we've talked about here, like so stress reduction. I mean, there's just so much. But if we're specifically talking about these components of fitness and um, exercise guidelines for health, yoga can certainly play a part. I don't, I don't think we, I mean, I think we would definitely say that for sure plays a part, um, but we need, there needs to be more. It's like not complete in and of itself. Yeah. And if a good way, if you were really interested in figuring this out for yourself would be to throw a heart rate monitor on and record the session. So polar, like, if you have a polar heart rate monitor, it gives you the amount of time in each of these zones. I think they break it up into five. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. can see how long your heart rate was above 120 That's a good point. during the course of your hour of yoga. And then that would kind of tell you, well, for each, if you're being, if you want to get into the weeds about it, okay, well, if I'm trying to accumulate 150 minutes, well, I got 10 minutes from that yoga class. So now I need mm. to go do 20 minutes of brisk walking or, you know. That's Whatever. a good point. So like on an individual level, an individual could choose to do that mm -hmm. if they were going to use heart you know, rate you as could, a measure. Yeah, you could just, you could do it all the time. You could do it once just to see. Yeah, totally. Learn more about yourself and your body and your movement. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, yeah, so I think hopefully this conversation was educational in terms of kind of introducing these components of fitness and explaining what um, what they are, how we might think about them. Hopefully this helps kind of broaden our understanding and helps us realize, you know, what a yoga practice could be about when we're talking about uh, these terms. And then we can choose, we can be more intentional about what we do within our own yoga practice or what we do off the mat in terms of our greater movement practice. It can just help inform us so that we can optimize for ourselves or for our yoga students if we're yoga and movement teachers. But yeah. yeah, yeah. So do you have any other like final thoughts about about whether yoga counts as exercise. It does count as exercise. It yeah. doesn't count as being your only form of exercise. That's probably how we can I, sum it up, right? I agree. <laughs> cool. Uh, well, thank you so much, Travis, for having this conversation with me. And I totally learned by talking to you about, um, about all these different aspects of me yoga too. and movement. Yay, so Thanks, thank Jenny. you.